Welcome to Colony TV, the governmental educational channel for the town of Colony. All right, well, welcome to Meet the Author. My name is Joe Nash. Today we're talking to Karen Lynn Greenberg. She teaches over at Siena in the English department. She has a new book of short stories. I hope you can see this cover because it's very eye-catching. It's called Faulty Predictions, a book of short stories. We're going to talk about her writing and life at Siena. And she will be here on October 16th for our noon, our noon author talk. It's a Thursday. So welcome, Karen. Thank you. Um, why don't we start with... How did you, before we talk about the specific stories, give us the capsule biography. Before we started, I was already talking to you. You've already lived about 10, 10 times as many places as I have. So give us a little capsule biography, and then we'll talk about your, your stories. Okay. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, and I went to college at Bryn Mawr College outside of Philadelphia, and then worked after college for about a year and a half um, teaching adult ed and GED classes. And then I went to graduate school. I went, I got an MA at Temple University, and then went to the University of Pittsburgh and got an MFA. And I graduated from Pitt in 2006. Right. And then you do have an Albany connection. What did you were I telling do. me? For, tell us that. Yeah, my parents. <laughs> my parents lived here before I was even born. Okay. My my dad went to Albany Med. So oh, okay. yeah. So before I, I didn't mention on the introduction. I should mention this. Your book here has won the Flannery O'Connor Award for short fiction. Um, and the book is published by University of Georgia Press, and I was looking at the back of some of the past winners, and you're in, you're in excellent company here for this award, so congratulations on that. Thank um, you. So were you always, were you always a writer, of, or did that come later? Or? Yeah, I've always, I always liked to write. Um, when I was little, I liked to draw a lot, so I would draw and write, illustrate my own stories. Mm -hmm. um, and then by the time I got to college, I, I, I knew I really liked writing and did an English major, um, did a creative writing concentration, so got to, okay. got to do, write a lot of stories Yeah, while I was in school. So when did you realize, I guess you should say, that you perhaps not only wanted to do this maybe for a living, but had sort of the talent, I should say, for people what these stories are excellent. Thank um, you. <laughs> that you had the talent, were you, did, did you have a certain teacher, or did someone publish something without you knowing, or you know, the usual kind of? <laughs> no, I mean, it, you know, I think what I, what I understood was that this is something I really liked to do. You know, I think when I was writing, it was um, something where I could write for hours and not know that the time was passing, you know, and just realize this is something that I like, and this is something that, that I want to pursue. And, you know, I think I, I realized pretty early on that it's a, it's a kind of hard thing to do. Um, it's hard to get published, you know. And so, I mean, for a long time, I was just really mostly concerned with just getting better, just kind of reading, mm -hmm. writing, learning. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't necessarily one moment, one teacher, one publication. Oh, okay. It was just kind of keep going. And I noticed from your uh, from your various teaching jobs in the English departments, you've. I don't know. Can you give us that rundown again before we start? You gave me the whole Yeah, story. yeah. Um, so after, after I finished grad school, um, my first job was at Missouri State University. It was in Springfield, Missouri. So I was there for two years um, teaching creative writing. Then I moved to Ohio, taught at the College of Worcester in Ohio for three years. And I was at Appalachian State for in North Carolina for one year. And then this is I'm going into my third year at Siena. Okay. Well, one thing in your stories, you know, some authors, I don't want to say they write the same thing over and over, but some authors, you can always tell one of their stories. Your stories, you've written in this book, first person, second person, and third. Second person, not usually done. <laughs> you've, got, you've got protagonists that are old, young, um, different ethnic groups. And I, have you always tried writing in different uh, voices, or do you just think of a story and it kind of comes out? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I like doing a lot. I mean, it, it, to me, that's the fun of fiction, right? <laughs> just kind of trying on different yeah. voices, different types of characters, um, playing with point of view, um, kind of challenging yourself with point of mm -hmm. view, right? I mean, there's a story in here that's first person plural. It's this we group, right? So how do you tell a story from a from a we perspective? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's just as as I've been writing them, just from story to story, it's kind of what what point of view do I want to use? What kind of character do I want to use? Um, 
and so during the writing process, I think it was great to just just have so much range. But then I think in some ways it becomes a little bit more difficult to um, get a collection that has yeah. these stories that are kind of all over the place um, published because I think I think oftentimes it's it's hard to just say uh, you know this story's about this and this is about this and it's about this place and that place and this kind of character. Um, so I, I think you know when I was thinking about putting this particular collection together, I was thinking a lot about how how, how could it be cohesive, and I was thinking a lot about voice and tone, um, and I think these are stories that you know, for the most part, I think um, have humorous moments, but are still dealing with kind of serious topics. So I think I think it was definitely tone. I think was what okay. what to me pulled them together. Well, one thing about your stories, and maybe we can, we can you can mention some. A lot of your stories have um, these moments of, I guess you could say, revelation or or um, or um, let me see. Oh, a, a person has a small moment or a small realization, something about their life. You don't really go for the full-blown epiphany, as they, mm. like the end of the dead by James Joyce. Right, right. You, I mean, I, I don't know if life is really epiphany. Life to me seems more small moments. But your stories, all oh, a lot of the characters, whatever age, there's always a moment where many of them, they come to the, they have these little moments of realization. Is that what do you, what do you think about that as opposed to the full blown? Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. It's interesting that you you mentioned the dead because I think that that was a story that um, when I was a student that I was taught in almost every every creative <laughs> yes. writing class. Was probably the, still the model of the epiphany. Yeah. This yes. is a huge realization. Um, and it's at the very end. And right. some of your characters, what I like about some of the stories, in the middle of the story, they they stop for a moment and wonder what they could have been or something. Yeah, I mean, I think that, and I think that in life sometimes we do have these huge epiphanies, but I think that they, that more often than not we have small, you know, small moments of realization or change. And one of the things I tell my students is something's got to be different at the end of the story than it was at the beginning. So from page one to, you know, the last page, there has to be some sort of change. And sometimes it's really tiny. Sometimes it's really, it can be huge. Um, but just some sort of movement. So I always just think about that. I think about some kind of change. And then also, you know, you think about a particular character and how capable are they of change? How capable of, are they of epiphany? And some characters are, and some characters um, might not be. It might be just the tiniest, tiniest movement. Well, sometimes the realization isn't even something that might even change them. Right, least. right. It might um, be a momentary thing. Um, and the other, another thing about your stories, I notice I, um, a lot of the people in the stories note um, you know they're getting older they're realizing they aren't going to say do the things they wanted or be who they wanted to be and that's you know it's one of those moments but that is in many of the stories or people thinking back what they you know what is that a theme with you or what <laughs> that's interesting I, I didn't thought of it as a theme but yeah I mean as a reader you're, you're picking up on this I think you're right I mean I think there's definitely several stories with, with older characters I mean for me it was just a matter of um, trying to create characters who are different from who I am and trying to, you know, hopefully imagine in a way that seems realistic what they would be facing, what they would be dealing with. Well, then how, how let's see, you talk about your different voices. One of your stories, you're, you're, you're talking about, um, or the main character is a woman who is driving a bus. Uh, it seems like she had a, an alcohol problem and mm -hmm. she, she flunked out of veterinary school. And in a, another story, you have two older women in their 70s. But both of them, I, they're very believable. I know you're... How Thank did you. you um, <laughs> when you're writing a story, do you... Do you how, do this, how, does this, how do you decide I'm going to write from the 70-year-old perspective or the high school male teacher perspective? I mean, how do you, yeah. is that just what you were saying before? You just like to try different... Yeah, different sparks for different stories. I mean, actually, um, that's the story that you're mentioning with the two women in their 70s. And actually, this is, that was the only story in here that's left over from grad school. And I actually started in a class where we did imitations of other writers. And actually, that story started as an imitation of Flannery O'Connor, mm -hmm. we which was uh, kind of interesting. Yes, yeah, so the O'Connor Award. <laughs> um, where we would, you know, we would study the techniques of writers, and then we'd use these techniques that, you know, it could be small things, like how they use a simile or a metaphor. Mm -hmm. It could be you know, bigger things like how they use conflict in a story. And um, I was really looking at that story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, um, with O'Connor and kind of using her grandmother character mm -hmm. as, as a model. And that, that's where that story started from. So I just wanted to kind of... Um, but it's, yeah. it's, it's so much better than just a writing exercise. It's a really good story. Thank I mean, you. It went, yeah. through, it went through probably, oh, okay. I mean, it went through like five years worth of revisions. Oh, so it, really? started, it started as an exercise and then just, I, I'm probably just like hundreds of drafts just oh, yeah okay. again and again but that was the seed of that one well you know short stories you have to 
do so much, you have to compress everything down, either events or emotions, whether it's five pages. Some of your stories are five pages. There's one that's like 30. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, several of these stories could be a novel. But um, how do you, um, you know, is that difficult, compressing it all down? Because you only, you, you only got 20 pages to tell right. You have to go through a whole range where a novel you get get to take your time. But. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was something that took me a long time to learn how to do, because I think ultimately stories, you want to capture these moments that are important, or like we were talking about earlier, show some sense of change. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a matter of picking those moments that, that are right, you know, for, for the story. And I think when I first started writing, my stories were long in a way that they didn't have to be long. And I, I see this too with a lot of students' stories, where, you know, you kind of you write around, like, with the scene that's essential. Yeah. And then it's just, I think it's a matter of learning to trim away. It's learning, you know, what's what's the most important scene. Um, you know, the, the one of the questions I, I tell my students to ask is why this day when they're writing a story? You know, why are you why are you focusing on this particular day or these days or these weeks? You in, know? in the story. Yeah. Like why yeah. this event? Why that? Oh. Yeah, I mean, because when I first started writing, you know, you come up with a character and then you just kind of want to write about their lives, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that you end up with a slice of life, right? Because, I mean, you think about our lives and, you know, lives are not full of plot the way a story is full of plot, right? So, I mean, you can describe, you know, um, somebody getting up and brushing their teeth and going to drink their coffee. And that's not interesting, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, it's sort of what's the latest moment in that day that you can start this story? So, I mean, these these are questions I had to teach myself to ask. Okay. You know, otherwise, you're just going to end up with pages and pages. And even if you have, you know, 200 pages, it's not necessarily a novel. It mm -hmm. might just be descriptions of stuff. So, yeah, I think just finding, you know, why this day, why this moment, I think it's a good so question. What, if you were to, if I was to ask you your definition of what makes a great short story, what would you, what would you say? <laughs> well, in, I mean, I, if, if you would only let me say one thing, I would say conflict. I would say conflict. Yeah, I would say trouble. Right, Trou trouble is what makes stories interesting. You know, and this is something I always think about. You want stories to function in a way that you don't want real life to function. Right, you don't want trouble. You know, you want <laughs> you want things to go smoothly. But if you read a story where everything goes smoothly for a character. It's not really a story, right? It's a list of events, mm -hmm. right? So I think you want to you want to think about how can you introduce trouble into the lives of these characters. And not necessarily trouble like in a bit. It doesn't have to be uh, huge, huge uh, trouble. You know, I mean, it could be. Um, it could well, be just like in the small. one story, the college, the bus driver, the students, these sort of half drunken college students get on the bus with a pig, right? That they've sort of mistreated. And right, and that's trouble, right? That's right, right away. And the story, that's right, that story's only like, what, four pages? Yeah, I think it's like three and a half pages. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, if it were a story just about this bus driver doing her route and nothing mm. unusual happened, it, w it wouldn't be a story. So yeah, that pig introduces trouble. Okay. Another thing about your stories, um, I've, I noticed, um, besides a, f a few things we talked about, a lot of your characters, um, the middle-aged, oh no, I shouldn't say that, even the, the guy in his 20s and the last one. People seem to be making compromises with with their lives or themselves as they, what's, as that seems to be a common thread also in your... <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, again, I think that, you know, I think it's, again, goes back to this idea of trouble and conflict. I mean, I think if characters are, are happy, if characters get what they want, then there's no story, uh, yeah, right? Uh, there's, there's, um, you know, this, this exercise I do with my students where we, we talk about dialogue and we talk about how if you have a character saying no to another character, then dialogue keeps going, right? If I said to you, you know, can I have a dollar? And you said yes, we're done, we're, right? Okay. But if I said, can I have a dollar? And you say no, we keep going, right, going. And that's the same sort of idea here, right? Where these characters don't get what they want and that, that leads to, to more plot. Okay, now, why don't, I was gonna, why don't you read what we talked about? Um, Karen's gonna read um, an excerpt from one of her stories, give you a flavor of her, of her style. And um, like I say, she's gonna be here on Thursday, October 16th, to talk about writing and um, her stories. And you can probably come and ask her questions. And maybe she'll have some books if you wanna buy, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. So, which, what were you going to read again? So, I'll read uh, Designated Driver. That's the story that's in second person. Okay. So, I'll read the first part of okay. it. This is the beginning of a story called Designated Driver. Okay. You're a bus driver now, and tonight is Halloween, which means drunk college students riding the bus to and from parties. Eventually, someone will make a mess. Vomit, vampire makeup smeared on a window, a can of soda sloshed on the floor. 
And it's your job to clean it up, even though you've written numerous lengthy letters to the transit authority regarding the fact that you're a bus driver, not a maid, and someone should be hired to clean the buses. On 4th Street, Frankenstein steps up with his two large black platform shoes and trips on the third step. He flails for the handrail and reaches it just in time. A smudge of green body paint remains on the silver handrail after he climbs the steps. At the next stop, two nurses enter the bus, and you hope the second one, the one with the flat ironed hair and scrubs with pink bunnies on them, doesn't recognize you. She was there the second and third time you went to the emergency room to get your stomach pumped. She was the one who gently inserted the tube down your throat, administered the saline solution, and told you it was going to be okay as you waited for the fluid to clear. You remember that her name is Connie. She flashes her bus pass and walks by quickly and doesn't look at you. The nurses are dressed in scrubs, but they have only small purses with them, and their hair and makeup is done, so they are not going to the hospital for a night shift, but to a Halloween party dressed as nurses. Although this nurse has seen your humiliation twice, her lack of imagination regarding her costume somehow makes you feel better about things. On 8th Street, four college-age guys step onto the bus through the back door. Passengers are supposed to enter through the front door and exit through the back. The boys are wearing straw hats, overalls buckled over bare torsos, and bandanas tied around their necks. The last boy that gets on the bus has curly red hair poking out from under his hat and is carrying a baby pot-bellied pig. He's arrogant about it, doesn't even try to hide the pig, and you immediately dislike him. You can't get on the bus through the back door, you tell them, watching their reflections in the rearview mirror. You don't want to turn around because you don't want the nurse to see your face, so you say it facing forward. What? shouts one of the boys, whose head is shaped like a potato. You tilt the rearview mirror. Connie is talking to her friend. This is a college town. You're sure she's seen her share of alcohol poisonings. It's been over a year since you last saw her. She's probably seen thousands of patients since then. The chances are slim that she'd remember your face. You turn around. We're already on the bus. Do you want us to get off and then get back on through the front door? Says the smallest of the boys, the one, only one without muscular arms. Why is he with the others? In another situation, you might guess he's the designated driver, but tonight you're everyone's designated driver. His question seems earnest, and you wonder whether he's a nice boy or just simple-minded. Come up here and show me your passes, you say. They walk up and each flash their college ID, which gets them free bus rides. You can't have an animal on the bus, you say. They're not allowed, and besides, you don't like animals anymore. It's a seeing eye pig, says the redhead. It's part of our costume, says the little one. Are you guys supposed to be strippers, you say, although you know they are not? Uh, farmers? The potato-headed one says, pointing to the red bandana tied around his neck, as if this is some sort of well-known symbol for farmers. What are you supposed to be, the redhead says. Like, a bus driver? One of the boys, whose pointy-nosed face reminds you of a ferret, laughs a hard, wheezy laugh. His head is too small for his over-muscled body. Miss, says a thin older woman wearing a laminated ID card hanging around her neck by a string. Could we please go? I'm going to be late. She's probably a night shift worker, maybe a janitor on her way to clean a building at night. She, like you, is one of the invisibles, one of the people who keep things running. You don't want her to be late. Oh, very good. So you'll have to read the rest of that story. It ends up being actually a very poignant story. Um, is there any reason? That's the one in the second person. Mm -hmm. Again, not, not a common... Um, point of view. Would, any, any reason why you chose that second person in that, or just yeah, I it think, seems to go with the story for some. Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> second person often works well um, to depict sort of difficult situations, situations that are kind of hard for um, a narrator to talk about. I always, I always think of it kind of as this displaced first person. Mm -hmm. Like you know, if it's, you know, it's like if you're standing outside a door that you're scared of going into a place, you say you can do it, you can right. go in, right? You kind of talk to yourself in that way. I most picture it as this character who doesn't want to say. I had these problems in the past. I'm struggling with these things. You kind of like put it onto mm -hmm. the, a you, but yeah. it's really, a, I think it's. I think it really kind of is supposed to, in this case, at least sort of function as like a first person kind of yeah. talking no, to herself. No, it's, it's a, that's um, a very good story. And I should say, um, a lot of your stories were published in, you know, it was Kenyan Review, Antioch, North American Review. These are like really the most prestigious um, literary journals, wouldn't you? Thank you. Wouldn't you say? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it was years and years of submitting them to, to journals. Yeah, lot, lot, lots of rejections for, for oh, these I, stories, too. Yeah. Um, and I think I, one of your interviews I was reading on your website, these 10 stories, they were windowed down from several. I think you said you kept 
submitting it? Yeah. Like reworking the order and the stories, the old, the new, and. Yeah, I mean, so basically I started, I, for for my MFA program, my graduate program, we had to put together a manuscript of stories um, you know, before we could graduate. And so I had this manuscript of stories. It was probably about the same length, you know, in 2006. And I thought, well, I have a manuscript of stories. I should submit it to story contests. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started submitting um, to Flannery O'Connor, but also to other, other um, contests as well. And, you know, Every year, I would just say, "Well, I've written some new stories, so I'll pull some old ones out, yeah. put some put some new ones in." Um, and then th this year was the first time I really, as I was saying earlier, just kind of thought about how how will this all fit together yeah. as a collection. So you know, I think um, this collection looks pretty drastically different from the collection from two thousand six. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how do you what do you think of the? Uh, I know there's less magazines these days, and everyone's reading less and less. I mean, they're reading more, but they're reading in shorter, what, shorter bites? I don't know. Mm -hmm. but what's the state of the short story today? Do you have an opinion on that? Or <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people uh, talk about, oh, you know, people aren't reading short stories. And I think maybe, you know, um, novels are what's always going to sell the best. Mm -hmm. But from what I've seen, there's a lot of um, passionate readers out there and people are interested in short stories there's a lot of um, as you said journals out there um, some of these journals have you know from universities have gone online because of um, budgetary reasons but I think that that's okay I mean I think there's more readers more more eyes on these things um, I, th I think I think short stories are, are great I think you know also there's an the argument that our attention spans are shorter and my argument yeah. would be, well then short stories are per perfect know. you know <laughs> um, so I, I think I think short stories are doing okay and I, I, I do think also you Know, awards like this really, really help. You know, okay. to get get stories out there too. And then the book comes out. Um, we're filming this in August, but your, your book's coming out this September. Um, I've already ordered three copies for our library. Just Thank so you. Watching if they want to come in and check it out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, as far as short stories go, I mentioned to you your stories before we started. Um, they reminded me a lot of Ann Beatty and Bobby Ann Mason, but. If you were teaching a class, do you teach a class on short stories? I do, I do. If, if, if I was to ask you to name, like, I don't know, three or four or five all-time favorite short stories in the genre, just, can you give me a few? I, wanna, I wanna get an idea of what, you know. Um, I'll, I'll tell you some of the stories I always teach. Always um, teach, okay. Yeah. Or the ones you teach the most, or the yeah. ones the students really like the most. What, what are some yeah, I them? always teach something from Jhumpa Lahiri's collection, Interpreter of Maladies. Um, oh, okay. The past couple of years, I've been teaching a story called A Temporary Matter um, about a couple who loses their, their child. And I think it's a really good story for um, thinking about just how to deal with emotional subject matter. That's, that's in Interpreter of Maladies. It is okay. in Interpreter of Maladies. Um, there's a story that um, I really like, that, I, that the students really like, um, called Midnight Raid by Brady Udall. Um, it's from a collection called Letting Loose the Hounds. Okay. Um, and it's about, a fa it's a father-son story, but it's um, this, this father is estranged from his family. The son had a goat and the f after the father and the mother split up, the goat, um, he kind of neglected it and it died. Mm -hmm. And then he decides he's going to get a new goat and bring it to, to his son. And I think that that's a great story in terms of um, looking at how far will a character go to get what they want. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he, he wants to be reunited with his son, so he will go in the middle of the night and carry a goat to his son's okay. new house. I you know? I and, and I pair that with um, a story by Tobias Wolf called Powder that okay. I really like. Um, and it's another father and son story, but we, just, we can say, you know, because a lot of times students will say, well, I don't want to write a story that's already been written, you know. You say, well, there's these basic plots, but it's about how you how you fill them out. And this is about a father and a son um, who, who get stuck on a skiing trip, and the father kind of convinces the son to drive down a snowy mountain. Oh, okay. uh, I think that's a, a good story. Um, there's a story I like a lot um, that my students like too. It's called Lita and the Swan by um, a writer named Eric Puckner, and it's written in the form of a school paper. Oh, okay. And so it's so it's this 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 character writing. It starts as a paper on Lita and the Swan, oh, okay. but then ends up really being about her life and about uh, about her sister and just things that are happening in her family. And I think that's a great story um, to look at this idea of what does a story have to look like? Could it look like a paper? Could mm -hmm. it look like something else? You know, and I think that that's a fun okay. story to teach. I haven't heard of many of those. I thought you were going to say Chekhov and James Joyce and those are good too. <laughs> John Cheever or something. <laughs> you know. um, well, I don't know, before we finish here, I want to ask you. Um, I should tell people the story, the collection here take, take place various parts of America, all social milieus, is that the right word? But uh, you, the, um, how did you get the idea, and maybe you can, you can explain it briefly. The last story here, 
the half and half club. Mm -hmm. a good, really good story. How did explain if you can briefly this about it? And how did you get the idea for, okay, yeah. for, <laughs> for that story? Yeah, actually, uh, that's a good question because this story. When you know, I started thinking about how is this going to hold together as a collection, and I thought, what if I have a story? I actually thought of it. I was going to have it as the first story in this collection. But what if I have a story that kind of has all these different types of characters? Because it's, it's a long story, as you said, and there's lots of protagonists. It kind of jumps around to lots of different characters, um, and there are, you know, different stages that could be of life, a whole novel. like you said. Like, you could yeah, that yeah. <laughs> um, so I thought, what if I write this story and kind of use it as that f the first story in this, this collection, and basically give um, readers the idea that these stories are going to be about all different kinds of people, all different ages, all different, you know, just kind of all different backgrounds. Um, but then it kind of spiraled out of control. It ended up being like a, you know, 30 some, 30 some page story. But yeah, it started with, um, in the beginning of the, the story, you know, there's this idea of this club, half and half club, right? These, these um, students who come from, you know, different ethnic backgrounds. And actually, um, when I was in college, I joined a club that was like this. And the, um, one of the first activities that was suggested was bring in photos of both your parents and mm -hmm. photos of yourself and we'll put them up on a big bulletin board and then we'll have see we'll see if people can match up the parents with mm -hmm. who their children are and I just that idea just stuck in my head and I was always like I gotta write a story about that and that so that was the seed for because mm -hmm. that's that first scene where the um, the teacher who's in charge of the club is kind of trying to put together well, a bulletin then you board have the, with this you, you come up with somebody in the in the story says Every ethnic group has some kind of food that you wrap in. Crap. Right, <laughs> right. So that becomes their activity. Okay. That that I made up, okay. but yeah, yeah. So that's a right, it's an excellent story. Well, I mean, really good, very good. Um, so very very good collection of stories. I wish you success with it. Thank you. And it's already won an award. Um, so perhaps when it's officially out, there'll be others in you know, others in your future. And again, Karen's going to be here. Thursday, October 16th, for our noon author talk. You can come to the library, and she's going to talk, maybe read from a different story than you did just now, and and you can maybe ask her questions or whatever. So thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me. And we will see you next time on Meet the Author.